end is just a new beginning It's not the end at all With one farewell comes a new greeting From silence with a rise, a new song Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and are sitting comfortable in your stretchy pants today, right? I have clothes that are a lot more comfy to wear after holidays and vacations, and most of them are black. How many of you like black, right? Thank you for making time to be in God's house. I know it's a busy season, but I also know that it blesses God's heart to see you making time for the Sabbath. Amen. How many of you know there's no better place to be today than in God's house, right? You know, we have a lot of special things happening during the Christmas season, and um, you know, this is really one of my favorite times of, of the year with my church family. Just appreciate you for being such a generous church. I was talking to our uh, outreach director, uh, Stephanie Cadango, who's doing a great job, and we've had several outreach projects going on. One of them is the angel tree where gifts are bought for those uh, children who have a uh, father and mother who are incarcerated. And we had so many that wanted to be a part, they had to get more names, both for our church and for our community. So how many of you are thankful to be part of a caring community as well? Amen. <laughs> Such an awesome place. And, uh, you know, and then we've had opportunities to supply food and warm clothes to those in need in our region. And we have had an abundance given. She said those two barrels out back have already been filled and we're on our third one. So we're grateful for such generous hearts. You know, Jesus said that we can't give a cup of cold water to one of his little ones without a reward from him. So thank you for living with such giving hearts. Would you turn to somebody and say, thanks for being amazing? <laughs> We're in, a, we're in a series today on resilience, and I believe, and I know you do too, that we can be resilient people because of the faith that we live with, amen? When problems come, they, don't knock, they may knock us down, but they don't knock us out, amen? We get back up, and we keep fighting the good fight of the faith. I'm always so encouraged every year by our stories of thanks. It's one of my favorite stories, because people in our church family, they trusted God in the middle of troubled times, and now they have a testimony of God's goodness, of what he's done, and his faithfulness. I know I'm looking at a lot of people this morning in this church, because as Jim said, we've been here you know, over three decades, so we know your stories, know so many of your stories and what God has done. But I'm looking at people who have gotten back up after life has knocked you down. You didn't quit, thank God. Whether it was a loss in your life of some kind, whether it was a relational difficulty, a divorce, whether it was a habit that wanted to keep hold on you, you didn't stay down, amen. And we're here today, all of us, we're here, we're standing because we have a God who's given Given us a faith that we can fight with. Amen. So thank you for being resilient people today. I want to share today on preparing our hearts for progress. I want to talk about maturing personally and with the people in our world. You know, we can read in three of the gospels, three out of the four gospels, where Jesus was asked the same question. He was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And that's a good question because the Bible is a thick book, right? It's got a lot to say, but, but his answer each of the three times was the same. It was number one, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And number two greatest commandment was to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus said all the law, all that the prophets had said, the whole Bible can be summed up in those two commands, to love God and love people. Now that makes it simple, doesn't it? But how many know it doesn't make it easy, right? It doesn't always make it easy. I know you, have, like me, have had a time when loving God meant doing something hard, like saying no to your flesh or saying or standing or fighting, you know, in the midst of persecution. Or maybe you've had some people in your world that weren't always easy to love. Don't look at anybody right now, but we all know that. Bob Goff wrote a book called Love Does, and he said something funny but true. He said, love difficult people because you're one of them. We've all had days when we're difficult to love. So we're going to talk about what it looks like to practice these two commands. What questions can we ask ourselves to keep us on track of loving God and loving people well? How many of you remember the question, bless you, WWJD, what would Jesus do? 
That was a great question to ask when we doubted what to do in a situation. We'd ask, what would Jesus do right here? But let's ask this question. What does loving God look like? What does it look like to really love God? We can't see God. So what does it look like to love him? Jesus said in John 14, 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Loving God looks like obedience, right? It looks like obeying his word his commands, his voice. Verse 21 says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. That word command in scripture means an authoritative prescription. God's promises are prescriptions for life, new life, abundant life, and eternal life. I know you're glad today that Jesus gives, what Jesus gives us is not only good for this life, but it's good for the next life, amen? It's eternal life. Because of Jesus, we get to spend an eternity with God. Heaven's a real place, and how many of you have people up there that are waiting on you, right? People that you love. But you know, in order for God to give us the kind of life he's planned, uh, we have to follow him well. And that's why he requires our obedience. He's not trying to be heavy and harsh with us. He just wants us to have the life that he made possible to give us. All of us know when the doctor gives us a prescription, we have to take it if it's going to work, right? We can't just go stick it in the drawer somewhere and forget about it and not ever take it. No, if we want to get well, we have to take the prescription. You know, lots of Bibles have gotten off coffee tables and into hearts these past few decades in Victoria, Texas. Amen? They're not just sitting there, as Jim talks about, pressing flowers and, and, you know, holding important papers, but they're promises that have been planted in the hearts of God's people. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think what it looks, what it may look like to the enemy when we get up in the morning in the crossroads. We got coffee in one hand and a Bible in the other. I mean, you know, that makes the enemy nervous, right? <laughs> And then add prayer to that, and he's really, really nervous. Uh, But but we want to keep him nervous. Jesus said in in Matthew chapter 7 that obedience to his word, it's obedience to him that builds resilient lives. I'm going to read this verse. It says, whoever, everybody say, that's me. Say it one more time. That's me. Whoever hears these words of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Lives built on the rock are resilient. Jesus went on to say, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain, floods, winds blew and beat against it. That house fell and great was the fall. So one thing that shows us is we're all going to face storms in life. We're all going to have trouble. Raise your hand if you've never had trouble. Okay. Okay. That's true, right? We're all going to have trouble. That's part of living on this earth. My father used to say, you know, it's not about, not just about the the sweet by and by, it's about the nasty now and now, right? About what we have to fight with or for when we're living on earth. But the people who will not just hear, but they'll obey, that's a prescription for a resilient life, a life that's built on the rock. We've all had kids at times, and if you have kids who hear what you say, but they don't do what you say, right? They have selective hearing, kind of like our husbands sometimes, right, ladies? (laughs) Both of these heard Jesus' words, both of the sand and the rock, they heard Jesus' words. The only difference is one of them practiced it and one of them didn't. Loving God well makes us wise. I want to give a shout out just for a minute to our new believers today. You know, we've had so many people give their lives to Jesus and get baptized, water baptized in the last, just since January, so many. And, but if you're a new Christian, the, mob, the Bible may be new to you. It may look a little intimidating to pick it up and start to read it and then to practice it. But let me encourage you, if you're a new Christian, start, just start where you are. Just start where you are. Obey what you know. That's all that God expects of you. When you hear Pastor Jim preach about forgiveness and you think about that person that almost ran you off the road, you know, forgive them, right? Think about that person in the grocery store that, you know, almost made you have a bad day. Forgive, right? You hear Pastor Larry talking about the importance of our words. What do we do? We just start watching the words of our mouth. When we fall down, if you're a new believer, you fall down a lot. When we fall down or mess up, we don't give up. We decide to grow up 
in our faith. Amen? Proverbs says a righteous man, not a perfect man, but a righteous, somebody who's right with God, they'll fall seven times and rise again. Why seven? Is that all the time we get to fall? I hope not, because I mess up a lot more than seven, don't you? But what, what does seven mean? In Scripture, it's a number of completion or maturity. It's saying we fall down till we get mature in an area of our life. Babies fall a lot when they learn to walk, right? They're not mature, but they don't quit. They don't fall and give up and say, I'm never walking again, right? No, they eventually learn to walk and they learn to run. So as a new believer, you're learning to walk like babies do. You're gaining maturity in your faith. One day you'll not just be walking, you'll be running and you'll be strong in your faith and you'll have a life of stability. Amen. How many of you were once a baby Christian? All of us were, right? And we know the difference it makes to get back up. Let's give our new believers a good hand and just cheer them on this morning. We're proud of them. <laughs> to make progress as God's people, whatever situation, whatever circumstance, uh, we may be in today, we can ask this question, what is the wisest thing to do? How can I love or obey Jesus with my heart, soul, mind in this situation? What prescription does he give me in, in, in scripture? If you have any doubt, how many of you know you got people all around you today that can help you? People who know you, people who know God, and they can help us be wise and follow God well. I love during our stories of thanks when Danielle shared about how she had been to the doctor and found out that she was going blind. She couldn't see. Her friend, she called her friend Desiree and said, and, and Desiree said, as soon as she heard the news, she said, I'm picking you up and we're going to church tonight. And you know what? They came and God gave her a miracle. Now she's seeing, right? How many of you know that's the kind of friends we need in life? Friends that won't let us stay down. They'll pick us up and go the right direction. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 verse 15, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, don't, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, if one of my kids was going out of town, I'd say, be careful, you know, drive safe. But if there was rain or ice on the roads or snow on the roads and they were traveling, I'd tell them, be very careful. Be very careful. It's crazy out there. Well, it's a day to be very careful with how we live. Why? Because there's a lot going on out there. There's a lot in our culture that can have a ne negative impact on our life. Jim and I have been binge watching a show lately. You know what it is? Dick Van Dyke. Probably some of you have never heard of that. It's been around a long time. But boy, those were definitely days gone by. I was reading something where they couldn't, it was the first time ladies wore pants, slacks, on TV, on a show. I mean, you know, we're just glad if they have on pants today, right? <laughs> they, could, they couldn't sleep in the same bed. They didn't sleep in the same bed. They slept in two twin beds. We see a lot more than that today, right? We live in a culture where just about anything goes. We don't have to go looking for trouble. It's easy to find trouble. Just a click away, we can see, we can find anything we want. We can buy anything we want to. We can talk to anybody anytime we want. We can find all kinds of ways to satisfy any appetite or desire that we may have. It's really scary to, to, to see how easy it is to find what we may be looking for in life. Now, I'm not saying that's all bad. I love Amazon, right? I love to click and see it on my door the next day. And I'm thankful for a neighbor that gets my packages when I'm gone or when it's raining. Lori, thank you. I love DoorDash. How many of you love getting food right away? That's a good thing. That's awesome. But you know what? There's a lot that's not awesome. For this reason, Paul tells us today, just like he said it then, be very careful how you live. God's word addresses so much about how we are to live and act and talk as believers. We're not left on our own, and that's why it's important that we read the Bible in the morning, that we just take 15 minutes a day to see what God's saying to us, that we come to church to, to learn and to gain understanding. It's a prescription for life. God knows how to bring the fulfillment that we're looking for personally in our marriage, in our home, in our careers, our job. 
But then there are things in life that aren't specific in Scripture. They're not black and white. We have to let the Holy Spirit help us. Good news is he lives in every one of us if we're a believer. Turn to somebody and say, that's good news. We have the peace of God. Scripture says it acts like an umpire that calls things out or safe in our life. Sometimes, sometimes when things aren't black and white in Scripture, we have to learn to lean in and to listen because God knows what's best for us. He knows us personally and intimately. All of us are unique and we have different stories. If I started right here and went all the way around this congregation and asked you your story, every one of them would be unique. They would be different. We have different pasts. We have different strengths. We have different weaknesses. There may be some things we want to do sometime, there, but there may be a Holy Spirit hesitancy inside. How many of you have ever had that? Maybe a relationship we want to pursue. Maybe a place we want to go. It may be okay. It's not illegal. It's not immoral. It's not outright wrong. Maybe it's just unwise. They, maybe it just puts us on a path outside of progress with God. You know, if any of us saw a toddler standing by a pool, we'd do this, all of us would do the same thing. If they were there alone by themselves, we'd run to that toddler and rescue it, right? The toddler wasn't wet. The toddler wasn't drowning. But we know one step in the wrong direction could bring a lot of pain, right? A lot of regret. God tries to keep our lives from pain. He tries to keep us from regret. And it often starts with one unwise choice. Maybe not wrong. Maybe not sin, maybe just unwise. I'm sure if we've lived any amount of time, we all have regrets, right? Times we wish we could go back and do things differently. Maybe an a email or a text that we could unsend, right? Have you ever had one of those you sent that you thought, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that? A reaction we had instead of a response we could have given. I remember one time I was driving to Dallas and about 10 years ago, just so you know, it wasn't yesterday. And I got pulled over by a policeman and got a ticket for speeding. Well, I was so frustrated. I got so mad. I don't know why. I wanted to get to Dallas, right? And this man was stopping me from shopping. No. <laughs> I was so frustrated that I just put the pedal to the metal and I peeled out again. <laughs> and he stopped me again and gave me another ticket. I don't know why I told you that this morning. But I wish that day I would have had a do-over, right? I had to pay both tickets. I had to ask God and my husband for forgiveness. <laughs> but I want us to think about this. What would be yours and what would be my greatest reward in life? What would I look to the end of my life? What would I want to see for me, for my family? What kind of dreams do I want to see fulfilled? Scripture says God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. He's not just a rewarder. He's a restorer of our lives. In the same way, ask ourselves, ask myself, what would be our greatest regret? Something that we couldn't go back and undo or relive. That's the direction of our flesh. The part of us that doesn't want to obey God, we all have it. That's the direction our flesh, our enemy, wants to take us. He wants to try to get us to be unwise in life about. Scripture says our enemy comes only to steal, kill, and to destroy. None of those are good, right? He's a thief. Steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. Jesus leads us to rewards and not regrets. So I want to encourage you and me today to ask the question often, what's the wisest thing to do right here? What's the best decision I can make right now? What in this situation can I, how can I love God best? With my, with my, my, my spirit, my heart, my soul, my mind, how I'm thinking, what's the wisest thing to do? Amen. Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He wants to help us be wise and resilient in life. The second greatest commandment is to love people. Jesus tells us we're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. First of all, if we're going to ever love our neighbor well, we're going to have to love ourselves well. Amen. God wants us to love ourselves. He does because he created us and he loves us. Scripture says that we love because he first loved us. Our value comes from being loved and created by God. Nothing he makes is worthless. It's priceless. It's priceless. Amen. Yeah, I know we all have things 
you know, we wish we could change about ourselves. I wish, I, I wish God would have made me taller. I'm married to a guy that's 6'2". I don't even get close to that. <laughs> but I decided I'm going to be tall in heaven, right? Do you know that, Jim? You may not recognize me in heaven. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know if you can wish things and they happen in heaven. I'm not, I don't think you can. <laughs> I don't think that's biblical. But sometimes, but, but sometimes I wish God would have made me a little more logical too. But he made me and he made you exactly like he wanted you. And despite all of our imperfections or flaws or differences, he wants us to love who we are. Amen? Yes, he wants us to grow and be the best version of ourselves, but we're only going to love others well if we love ourselves well. Some of us need to get better today at loving ourselves. We need to say no to other things so that we can say yes to us, to our progress, to our well-being. Take time to invest in our spiritual, physical, and emotional health. I read a funny quote that says, almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. Everybody say, including me. God loves you, and he wants you to love you. Why is love so important? Because it's what keeps us together, right? Love for God and for each other. Rosalind Carter passed away. She was the, she's the, was the wife of Jimmy, President Jimmy Carter. She passed away this past week, and she was 96 years old. President Jimmy Carter still living. He's 98, but they were married 77 years. Jim, can you handle me another 40? Because <laughs> that's what it, exactly 40. That's amazing, isn't it? That took a lot of love. Love is what's needed for relationships to go the distance in life. I don't think anybody in this room today wants to do life alone. We want somebody beside us. How many of you love the story, stories of thanks of Sam and Elizabeth and how God brought them to each other? I love their story, but we want somebody beside us. We want family, friends around us. We want to be part of a community to do life with like this. You know, when we're ready to take our last breath, we're not going to care about what kind of car we drove. We're not going to care if it was a Chevy or a BMW. We're not going to care about the house we lived in, whether it was an apartment or whether it was a mansion. The only thing we're going to be thinking about that at that time is the people in our lives. And it takes a lot of love to have that when you, each the, when you reach the end. You know, we use the word love for a lot of things, so it can get a little confusing to really understand what Jesus is saying. We love pizza. We, I love my new pair of shoes. I love my new car. And we love our husbands, right? That just doesn't seem right <laughs> to compare your love for your shoes to the love, love for your husband, right? No, the word Jesus uses for love is different. Everybody say different. It's the word agape. It has to do with the decision and not an emotion. It can have emotion, but it's based on a decision. That's why Jesus can tell us to love our enemies, right? We don't like them, but we have to love them. We don't have any emotion. It's not an emotion. It's a choice, a commandment, not to feel a certain way, but to choose a certain way, to decide to love and bring benefit to another in life. Let me give you another piece of good news. If you're a believer today, we have the ability to love like God does. We don't have to depend on our own human love because that's not enough. Amen? We have his love to draw on. The Bible says this in Romans 5, 5, and hope does, not disapp- hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. This kind of love, God's love in us, has the potential to make any relationship better. It can go the distance. It can heal broken relationships and broken hearts. How do we determine if we're living, our, if we're loving ourselves and others well? Well, Jesus gives us a good gauge in the Gospels. This is what he said. Jesus said this. He said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. Then he says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Jesus is saying it's new because now you have an example. And that example is me. So we are to measure our love for others by how Jesus has loved us. That's a pretty tall, tall order, isn't it? To, to fill. Because uh, Jesus has loved all of us in this room today pretty well. The more we know Jesus, the more we love him because of how he's loved us. Amen. How many of you are thankful for Jesus? He's shown us the most incredible sacrificial love. He gave his life for us. Amen. You know, I'm sure when he told this to the disciples, it made them think about times he'd loved them 
when they weren't very lovable. Peter thought about the three times he denied Jesus, that he even knew after being with him three years, walking and talking, eating, sleeping, drinking with Jesus, and then he denied three times that he even knew Jesus. Yet Jesus found Peter when he was fishing, and he restored Peter and reminded him that he still had a mission in life. Jesus was patient and forgiving with Peter. Now Peter had to show that same patience and forgiveness to others in life. Maybe Matthew thought about how he had been a thief. He'd taken money dishonestly as a tax collector. But when Jesus walked by his booth, he didn't condemn him. He called him to follow him. Jesus believed that Matthew could be somebody different, and he was. Now Matthew had to believe in others too. Thomas doubted that Jesus really was alive. We all know doubting Thomas, don't we? He's got that name. But Jesus appeared personally to Thomas to show him he really was alive. Now Thomas had to love skeptics too because he had been one. Jesus has loved each of us in so many different and amazing ways. And he asked us to offer that same love to the people in our world. He asked us to show it through our actions, through our words, our attitudes, our forgiveness. A good question to ask with people in our world, whether it be our spouse, our children, you know, our neighbor, our coworker, our boss, what does love require of me here? What does God's love require of me? Scripture says that God is love. He is love. It's not something he has tagged on to his nature. He is love. Read the gospels if you have any doubt that Jesus loves people. Jesus loves people. He loves them well. Amen. God loves people. What does God's love require of me? Love is something God is. And when we love like he does, people see him. They feel him and they understand what he's like. At the end of World War II, much of Europe had been devastated. Buildings had been bombed and burned. The streets were full of rubble and dust. And there were lots of orphaned children and children who had been separated from their parents. It was a terrible time for children in Europe after World War II. Many without sufficient care and food and clothes. One morning during this time... An American soldier was driving his Jeep through the streets of London after it had been torn up by the war. And the soldier sees a little boy in shabby clothes with his nose pressed against the window of a bakery. The lights were on and the lady was making fresh bread and pastries. The soldier stopped the Jeep, went into the bakery, and he bought some pastries. When he walked out, he gave the bag of pastries to the little boy that had his face against the window. The boy looked with eyes wide and took the bag. And then as the soldier was leading, he felt a little tug on his jacket, on his coat. The boy asked him, he said, Mr., are you God? Mr., are you God? When we love well, we look like God to others. Scripture says others will know we belong to him by how we love each other. So many in our world need to see that kind of love, don't they? They've seen every other kind of love. They need to see God's love. Loving well helps us understand, others understand who God is. Amen. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that we can do a lot of heroic things in life. We can speak well. We can have great knowledge and understanding. We can have faith to move mountains. We can give all that we have away to somebody else. Even our own bodies, we can sacrifice. But he says if we don't have love, God's love, it won't mean anything. Why? Because love is the basis of the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. So we wouldn't have to die, but we could have eternal life. And he calls us to love our world like Jesus loves us. Paul tells us what love looks like so we can practice it. And this kind of love really does take practice. Listen to this. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It, is not, it does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I tell you what, how many of you got a ways to go before you can do all those, right? We all do. But man, we can proctor, we can love like this because we got God on the inside of us. He will empower us every day to live and to love like he does. Loving God and loving others well puts us on a path of progress, of reward with God. Amen. Can we pray together today, faith family? Lord, thank you. 
for who you are. So many of us here today, God, know what it means to be loved by you. Father, we've experienced your forgiveness your help, your healing, your redemption in so many areas of our life. We aren't perfect people, God, but we are loved people. And you've been good to us, and you call us to bring that same love and goodness to those in our world. God's scripture says that it's your goodness that leads us to repentance. So help us love you most and best in life. And then, Lord, empower us to love our family, friends, our neighbors as you love us, as you have loved us. Lord, that kind of love will never fail. It will bring about your best in our life and in others too. Thank you that we can show others what you're like by the way we love. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, thank you for listening so well this morning, Faith Family. I'm gonna ask if you would just to bow your heads uh, a minute before we go. And I just wanna ask an important question. Maybe you're here and you have never, you know, for one reason or another, maybe you've never had the opportunity, maybe you've never taken the opportunity, but you have never ever experienced the love and forgiveness of, that Jesus came to bring. Scripture says that we love, as I said earlier, we love because he first loved us. Maybe you haven't realized how much God loves you and wants to bring about his best into your life. He's not mad at you for things that you've done or haven't done. He just wants you to let him in so that he can love, so that he can heal, help, and lead you into his best in life. If you're here and you want to open your heart to this kind of love and forgiveness, this kind of Savior, would you show me by raising your hand in just a moment? I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to ask you to come down. I just want to pray for you at your seat. So I'm going to ask you on the count of three if you'll raise your hand. So one, two, if you want to open your heart to Jesus, three, would you raise your hand? Let me see it. Thank you. I see your hand. Just raise it high so I can see it. Ushers can help me. Raise it high. Let me see. Wave at me. Okay. See your hand. Thank you. Thank you. I see the hands. Thank you for raising your hand. Maybe you're here and you've walked with him before, but you strayed away. You served him once, but now you've strayed and you want to come home today. And you want to, you want to turn around and you want to, you know, just make a 180 and come back and, and serve God with all of your heart, the best of your ability. You want to rededicate, recommit your life. Would you slip up your hand? Let me see it. You're here and you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. Okay. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Give you one more time, one one more minute. I'm going to go around one more time. If that's you, would you slip up your hand? Make sure that we see it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, awesome. Well, let's pray this prayer out loud. Let's pray it together. Say, God, thank you for loving me. You love me so much that you sent a Savior to die for me so that I could be forgiven and spend forever with you. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, that you died and rose again as Savior of this world. Jesus, come into my heart, forgive my sin, and lead me into the life you prepared for me. I know I won't be perfect, but I have people to help me on this journey. Thank you for loving me in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give him a good hand. Several hands went up today. Amen. If you raised your hand today, we are so, so excited that you did that. It's the best day of your life. Change your eternity forever. And we are so excited about it. And we want to help you on your journey. You know, I've heard somebody say that a Christian without a local church is a spiritual orphan. And that's true because we all need a family around us, don't we? to grow in our faith, to grow in God. And you have a family around you today. And we, don't, we want to encourage you. We want to help you grow. We don't want you trying to walk this life out on your own. There's a gift for you as you leave today. And it's important because it, hel- it will help you. Uh, it's a white packet that has some information in it. Pastor Jim wrote a, a devotional, 30 Days to a New Beginning. That's there. There's a salvation card that will help us get connected to you uh, so that we can know what you did today. There's also a baptism card. And uh, baptism is what Jesus Jesus asks us to do, the next thing he asks us to do after salvation. Baptism is a water baptism that you saw today, and it's symbolic. When people go under the water, their old life of sin is buried, and it shows us that they're walking a new life in Christ. So we would encourage you to be baptized, to take that next step of obedience. Um, the um, 
there's a card in there that you could sign up for baptism. And also there's going to be something on the screen that will help you uh, connect to our baptism people. So Pastor Jim's going to come and say the blessing over you. But why don't you look at the screens, get that information. And thanks for listening so well today, Faith Family. Love you. Let's give Miss Tamara a good hand clap, amen, for a great message. That is one wise woman right there, and she's a great helpmate too. I, I guess God gave her to me because I need lots of help. Don't say amen on that, all right? Hey, before you go today, I want to really uh, encourage you to pray about something, and that is just go home and, and Google that story about how in 2017 there was this beautiful grove of mature sequoia trees. And as the fire raged through the Sierra National Forest, people who didn't understand God's process gasped because they thought these beautiful trees are going to be destroyed. But for those who understood God's process, they understood that there were seeds trapped in those sequoia trees. That the only way the beauty of those trees was going to live on and be even greater was for those seeds to come out. And I want to encourage you, that's why God allows trials in your life. And how many of you are, are determined that the rest of your life is going to be the best season of your life, regardless of the trial that you're going through right now? Amen? I tell you, loving God and loving people is a big part of that. A lot of people, man, they, they just can't stick in there because they have a lack of love. They have a love deficit in their life. And it's so good to be in a family where we honor our parents and we learn to obey God, where the truth is spoken, but we learn to love, we learn to stick together. Amen? I want to encourage you in one other thing, and that is next week we're going to start our new series, Till He Appeared. And if you know that song, Oh Holy Night, it's Till He Appeared and the soul felt its worth. We're going to learn the worth our soul should feel starting next week. I cannot wait to begin that series. And uh, that bump is one of my favorite all time that we ever created for Christmas where that cry pierces the night. And I just want to encourage you, let the cry of God's voice pierce your heart this holiday season. To some of you, he's calling you to new beginnings. If you saw how blessed the end was going to be, Man, you would embrace that new beginning so easily. Don't let fear, bitterness, condemnation, anything keep you from new beginnings. How many of you know God's new beginnings lead us to blessed ends down the road, don't they? God's new beginnings are awesome. Some of us let that cry draw you into the restoration God's dreaming about in this season. Let that cry draw you into the healing, into the new level of blessing that God's dreaming of in our lives Really looking forward to next week. And remember, you know, great local churches are blessings to our family. Because when we bring our family, when we bring our friends, their place's blessing begins. God helps families flourish in local churches. So bring your family with you. Bring your friends with you. I'm in a season now where I'm praying hard over all the families of Faith Family Church. Because I sense God's ready to do a special thing in us for us and through us. Can you say amen? Hey, let's all rise to our feet. I want to speak this blessing over you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you. Great being with you today. Why don't you high five somebody. Tell them how good it was to see him in the house of God. Amen. Amen.